Hi everybody, Asian Paints is one of the greatest companies in the history of India. And the most astounding thing about this company is that it is the only company to have grown at a CAGR of 20% since the past 60 years. And if you invested just 1 lakh rupees in Asian Paints in 2000, today at 3000 rupees per share, your wealth would be worth at least 1.87 crores and that too without dividends. The business of Asian Paints literally doubles every 3 years and it has been a market leader in the industry not for 5 years, not for 10 years but for the past 54 years. And if you draw a comparison of Asian Paints with its competition in Tickle Tape, you will see that while Berger stands at a revenue of 6869 crores, Nerolac has a revenue of 5793 crores, their combined total is 12,662 crores, but Asian Paints alone generated a revenue of 22,044 crores. Similarly, Berger generated a profit of 719 crores, Nerolac stands at 529 crores, their combined profit is 12,049 crores, but Asian Paints alone generated a profit of 3,139 crores. The question is, how did Asian Paints become such a dominating force in the paint industry? What exactly is their secret sauce that enabled them to be a market leader for 54 years? And most importantly, what are the business lessons that we need to learn from the greatest paint company India has ever seen? Before we dive into this lengthy case study, I want to quickly thank our sponsor Skillshare for supporting our content. Skillshare is an online learning community where millions of curious learners come together to take premium classes from famous creators and industry leaders. From marketing to video editing to UI UX design, they have it all. Last month, I took Nee Rial's class to learn about the hook model. And this month, I took up Gary Vee's class wherein he explained his social media strategy using real world examples of social media wins and social media losses. I learned the techniques of repurposing my content on multiple social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram and Twitter to build a long term relationship with my audience. The best part about Skillshare is that it is an ad free platform that works on a subscription model. This means just like when you pay for Netflix and you get access to all the shows on the platform, at Skillshare you get access to thousands of classes all at once including Indian creators like Alicia Souza's illustration class and Ekta Chaudhary's gardening class and a lot more. The subscription will cost you less than 2000 rupees a year that comes down to less than 166 rupees a month that is lesser than the cost of a Starbucks coffee. For things coolers, Skillshare is giving one month of free trial if you use the link in the description. This is applicable only for the first thousand people so go ahead click on the link below and explore the amazing things that Skillshare has to offer. The story of Asian Paints dates back to the volatile times of 1942 India and this is something that you might already know that during that time India was still under the British Raj, the World War II was still going on and the government had temporarily banned the import of paints in India. During those days, the paint industry in India had a few foreign companies and Indian players like Shalimar Paints were the major players in the market. But this ban resulted into a brilliant opportunity for domestic production. And spotting this opportunity, Mr. Champaklal Choksi and three of his friends set up Asian Paints in Mumbai in 1942. And one of the most amazing traits of this gentleman was that he was an incredible market researcher and he spent a lot of time understanding the paint industry. This is when he understood that there were two segments in the paint industry. One was the industrial segment and the other was the decorative paint segment. In the industrial segment, it was a B2B space that was all about supplying paint to giant factories and plants. Whereas the decorative segment was a B2C as in a business to consumer space wherein you could sell paint to the common man to paint his house. Long story short, initially the large distributors rejected Mr. Choksi so we turned to the villages wherein people painted the horns of the bulls and the South Indians painted the entrance of their house considering it to be auspicious. Looking at this demand, Mr. Chokshi started supplying to the village distributors. The demand soon enough shot up and within some time, the bigger distributors started approaching Asian Paints and in the next 10 years, with this rural to urban approach, they hit a revenue of 23 crores by 1952. Now the obvious thing over here is that they couldn't have become the biggest player just by selling paints for bullhorns, right? Then the question is, how did Asian Paints become the biggest player in the market? Well, this is where the second phase of Asian Paints growth started when Mr. Choksi noticed another huge gap in the market. During the 1950s, Mr. Choksi saw that there were two major products in the market. One was a basic dry distemper that was extremely cheap but it had the tendency to peel off, it used to stick to the clothes and it used to stink very badly. The second product was the plastic emulsion product that was free from all of these problems 
but was five times costlier than dry distemper. Therefore, it was unaffordable for the common man. So you know what guys? Asian Paints came up with a game-changing product called the Washable Distemper that was placed exactly between dry distemper and plastic emulsions. Now this was a revolutionary product because it had the qualities of plastic emulsion but it was way cheaper than the emulsion product. And this product was marketed using a very successful marketing campaign which said, don't lose your temper, use tractor distemper. And guess what? Within no time, Washable Distemper was a massive hit in the market and the company started taking giant leaps. Although the firm was not very profitable during the 1950s, from 1952 to 1962, the revenues grew at a compound annual growth rate of 21%, with margins rising from just 2% to 13% by 1962. And by 1967, that is 25 years after the company started, Asian Paints became the largest paint company in India. And the most astounding thing is that even today, that is even after 54 years, Asian Paints is still the largest paint company in the Indian market. Now this begs the question, in this volatile and uncertain market, with such a vast customer base spread across an extremely diverse country like India, how is it even possible that not a single company could challenge the position of Asian Paints? Well, the answer to that lies in three critical aspects of the Asian Paints organization. The first is a world-class supply chain that they've built over the past 60 years. And the foundation came way back in the 1960s. During that time, large multinational corporations used to offer at least 180 days of credit period to their distribution channel. And this included the shopkeepers, the dealers, the distributors who supplied paints to the retail customers. This channel allowed the distributors to expand the credit period even as long as one full year. For example, let's say you are a paint company and I am the shopkeeper and you gave me 60,000 rupees worth of paints that I am supposed to sell at 80,000 rupees. So I can take up to 6 months to sell the paint and then pay you back 60,000 rupees. And this means that for you, 60,000 rupees of capital is stuck and cannot be used. Now, if the same thing happens with 1,000 distributors across the country, that is 6 crore worth of capital of yours that will be stuck. This money cannot be used to buy raw material and for the next cycle, you will need another 6 crores. Which means what? You need an exorbitant amount of working capital to even survive in the market. This is the reason why the smaller players found it very difficult to enter the market. So, the entry barrier was very very high. But the one practice that was prevalent and even today it is still prevalent in any credit system is that even if the shopkeepers have sold 60,000 rupees worth of paints, when they have got 180 days to pay back, no one really bothers to pay back. And even if they did, they used to pay using post dated checks. Now the Asian Paints team understood this very clearly. So they came out with something called the regular payment performance discount, wherein the regular payback was incentivized. For example, a shopkeeper would get a 3.5% extra discount if he made the payments within 30 days throughout the year. Similarly, if a dealer made payments in cash, they would get a 5% discount on his procurement price. Now this was a very very big deal because the paint industry by default operated at razor thin margins at the dealer level. And these initiatives worked wonders because it was a win-win for both Asian Paints and the dealers. Why? Because Asian Paints was able to rotate its capital faster, so they were able to serve a larger network of distributors with very less working capital. And at the same time, the dealers were getting discounts and managed their working cycles better. Similarly, in the next 50 years, Asian Paints always remained a pioneer in supply chain management. In fact, Mr. Chambaglal Choksi bought the first ever supercomputer in India in 1970 for 8 crore rupees. And what blew my mind is that Asian Paints had a supercomputer 10 years before ISRO had it, 10 years before IIT Pawai had it, and 21 years before any other company in India had it. And they used these mainframes to forecast demand by which they could run their supply chains at insane levels of efficiency. They started branch billing on computers way back in the 1970s and even started using GPS for tracking the movements of their trucks. And the result? Well, in 1980, the Bandu plant used to operate with 1600 workers. But Akleshwar started production for the same capacity with only 250 workers. And by 1985, the same thing was done with less than 100 workers. So you see, in less than 5 years, they were able to improve their efficiency to such an extent that now they were able to operate at the same capacity with 1 16th of the workforce. All of this was done because of an insanely superior technology. Secondly, from 1970s onwards, Asian Paints removed all middlemen like distributors and wholesalers from its distribution channel. And this meant 
that they were supposed to supply directly to the dealers. And because of this, today, Asian Paints, the manufacturer, reaches 70,000 paint dealers without any channel intermediation. Therefore, with only 3 to 5% average margin for the dealers, Asian Paints is able to keep 95 to 97% of the margins for itself. Meanwhile, the extraordinary levels of efficiency have taken Asian Paints to such heights that even today, with 125 depots in its supply chain, while Nerolac generates a revenue of 40 crore per depot, Asian Paints generates a revenue of 100 crores per depot. Similarly, the revenue per factory for Nerolac is at 700 crores, whereas Asian Paints stands way ahead at a revenue of 1500 crores. This is the level at which Asian Paints operates. And this brings us to the second critical factor, and that is the relationship with dealers. A classic example of the same was the distribution of something called tinting machines. For those who don't know, tinting machines are the machines that could produce a large variety of shades using a small set of standard colors. For example, if you wanted saffron, the tinting machine will be able to mix red and yellow in appropriate quantities to give you the exact same saffron color that you're looking out for. So because of the usage of tinting machine, you no longer had to store every single color bucket in your inventory. And today, you can produce thousands of colors with the tinting machines without going back to the manufacturer. Therefore, the very presence of these machines meant that the sales of the company would skyrocket. And what blew my mind is that today, while Nerolac and Berger together deploy 46,000 tinting machines through their dealer network, Asian Paints alone has 50,500 machines. The question is, how is there such a stark difference between Asian Paints and others? Well, that is not just because of the extensive network that Asian Paints has, but also because Asian Paints built a seamless system for the adoption of the tinting machines. Because back then the problem was that tinting machines were manufacturer specific, they required significant space in the store and they were extremely costly. And while many paint companies asked the dealers to bear the heavy cost, Asian Paints used to bear the initial investment and then it would give the machine on a lease agreement to the dealers. This way, the dealers felt less burdened and the company established a solid relationship with its dealers. Therefore, the entry barrier even for small players was almost eliminated. This is the reason why the network of Asian Paints grew from just 15,000 dealers in 2001 to 52,000 dealers in 2018. Because even the smallest dealer in the market could afford to partner with Asian Paints. Furthermore, after some time, Asian Paints orchestrated a three-way agreement wherein banks funded the dealer and then the dealers repaid the loan to the banks over time. This way, the investments were not reflected in the company's balance sheet and at the same time, financing was made easy for the dealers. And even today, when I spoke to the few dealers in my circle, they told me that Asian Paints portal is so amazing that their queries get answered usually within just 24 hours. And regardless of whatever problem the dealer faces, the company has an extensive customer support team to help them out with extreme care. And even in the tier 4 cities, if you order products in the evening, it will be delivered to you by noon without fail. And in tier 1 cities, Asian Paints logistics system delivers goods 2 times a day and in some cases even 4 times every single day. Cherry on the cake is that Asian Paints has always gone beyond its call of duty to help its channel partners in case if they faced any unexpected problems. And as Jalas Dhani, an Asian Paints executive stated, and I quote, Dealers are a part of our family. If we find that they are affected due to unforeseen events like riots, floods, earthquakes, etc., we ensure that the best support is provided to them in every possible manner, including expanding the credit period so as to help them get back on their feet. This is the reason why, ladies and gentlemen, Asian Paints has the largest number of dealers and an extensive network that is far, far superior than its competition. And the third critical factor is their incredible levels of consistency. Now people, I don't know how many of you see this, but then in the past 50 years, the stakes of the founders have changed and just like any other giant company, even Asian Paints had some conflicts within the company. But even then, they have been remarkably consistent with their adoption of technology, they've been recruiting the same grade of talent since 1970s, and their marketing has consistently evolved with changing trends in the Indian culture. And last and most importantly, many companies fill their boards with friends and cronies in order to pay lip service to the legal requirement that mandates that 50% of the board should comprise of independent directors. But Asian Paints is among the rare breed of companies whose boards are truly independent. Out of 14 directors, Asian Paints has 7 independent directors who are credible individuals with extraordinary backgrounds who always make sure that the company is always a notch ahead of its competition. And this brings me to the last part of the episode and that is, since the past 54 years Asian Paints has been a market leader, that's fine. 
But today, what is Asian Paints doing to stay ahead of its competition in the next 50 years? To understand this, you will first have to look at the mega trend in the paint market. If you see, the cost of labor involved in painting at a home has increased from just 10% of the project cost in 1980 to 65% of the project cost. This is because from 2006 to 2015, the labor costs in India have grown at a CAGR of 9 to 10 percent, whereas the paint prices have increased at a mere 3 percent CAGR. So, in the next 10 to 15 years, labor costs are expected to be around 90 percent of the overall paint project cost. And when this happens, it will make more sense for you to buy paint from a store and paint a home yourself rather than employing painters and laborers. And once this happens, two consumption patterns are likely to emerge. Number one. Customers will be willing to pay for labor involvement only if there is a service-oriented value addition that cannot be done without expertise. This is the reason why Asian Paints has already started trying several service-oriented models. They've been opening experience stores in Mumbai, Delhi and Kolkata. They've opened Color Idea stores which provide color consultancy in mom and pop stores. They have Home Solutions Painting Service which currently executes 20 to 25,000 projects a year. And then we have Royal Play that is high-end textured paints. And apart from that, they've even started laying their foundations into kitchenware, bathroom fitting, furniture and even interior decoration. So to put that straight, Asian Paints doesn't just want to paint your house, they want to build and sell everything that is inside your house. This is the first trend, that is, the evolution of a service-oriented industry in the paint market. Secondly, the DIY model is expected to emerge. Currently, households do not adopt a DIY approach because of the lack of sophisticated tools. And number two, at 60 to 65 percent of the project cost, labor involvement is still affordable for many households. However, with sophisticated tools being introduced in the market and with the labor cost shooting up to 90 percent of the project cost, both these factors are expected to change the trajectory of the paint industry. This is the reason why Asian Paints is now venturing into building user-friendly DIY tools in order to empower ordinary people like you and me to be able to paint our house. This is what Asian Paints is doing to prepare for the future. So if this is very very clear to you, let's talk about the lessons from the case study. Lesson number one, no matter how big the players in the industry are, if you want to become successful, it is absolutely important to identify the gaps in the market. Lesson number two, and this is something we have seen even in the case of Toyota and Ford, that efficiency is one of the most powerful yet the most underrated aspect of business. And in the race of scaling up, companies often overlook the inefficiencies in their system. A classic example of the same was Ford and even Gillette. Whereas on the other side, we've got companies like Asian Paints who deploy incentives in the form of regular payment discounts and invest heavily into next-gen technology like a supercomputer to reach unthinkable levels of efficiency. Lesson number three, while on one side we've got companies that treat their employees as objects and exploit them in the name of efficiency, on the other side we've got Asian Paints that goes beyond its call of duty to make financing easy for dealers, to give them extended credit period during slack time, to resolve their queries with utmost care within 24 hours and most importantly to go out of the way to help them out during a calamity saving them from an unimaginable amount of pain and suffering. And lastly, while good brands have a legendary leader, a great brand has a legendary culture. In this case, it was the impeccable board of directors of Asian Paints, the star recruits from IM and the wise marketers of Asian Paints who have kept the legacy of the company not for 5, not for 10, but for 70 consecutive years. If this isn't an epitome of greatness, I don't know what is. That's all from my side for today guys. For your study materials, I'm attaching the links to them in the description. And please read this book called The Unusual Billionaires because I found some fascinating insights about Asian pains in this book for this case study. And if you learned something valuable, please make sure to hit the like button so that the YouTube algorithm knows that you learned something valuable. And for more such free business and political case studies, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.